Please be seated and open your Bibles with me to the book of Job. The book of Job. Job is a precious book to me, and I know it is to many of you. And it's proven helpful, immensely so throughout the millennia. A book written, perhaps the first of all of Scripture, written to attempt to answer the oldest problem for humans, the problem of evil. How does a world with so much suffering, so much evil, what appears like chaos, how could that world be ruled by a good God? It's my hope that we will not be able to go through every detail of the book, but it is my hope that by the end of this, you too will find that comfort that can only be found in knowing who that God is who rules this seemingly chaotic world. At the same time, the book of Job is enigmatic, difficult to interpret. It's easy to get lost in the many chapters of bad theology filled with half-truths and simplistic explanations for divine complexity. You've probably found yourself lost somewhere around chapter 13 or 14 or somewhere in that range wondering, is, is this right or wrong? What am I supposed to do with this? Do I believe it or reject it? The poetry and figurative language is sometimes just difficult to understand, hard to translate sometimes impenetrable, it appears, to our 21st century minds. And even still, when you zoom out, the message is clear. And the message is true, and it's meant to stir us up and strengthen faith, particularly a trial-enduring faith and the awe-inspiring, powerful, wise, and good, one true God. So to help us understand the details, we are going to zoom out on the book of Job, fly over the surface, zoom in at points to get the details. When you understand the whole, I think it will better equip you to understand the fine details as you study on your own. It sort of reminds me, last week I was playing with Andrew on the iPad, my, my eight-year-old son. He wanted to find his way to grandma's house. And he was zoomed in on Google Earth somewhere in Chandler and couldn't find his way. And for the life of me, I couldn't find my way either. I didn't know what I was looking at because I was down in the details. I had to zoom out. I could find it in context and then figure out what to do with the details. And we have to do that with the book of Job. You have to know the overall structure. You have to know the intents so that you know what to do with the words that you read, particularly the words from Job's unhelpful friends. So it's my hope and prayer that in the next hour I would accurately preach the message of Job and that your faith, if you're suffering now, and your faith when you will suffer, because we all will, will be prepared to endure with that faith intact at the end and most of all that God would be glorified today. Will you pray with me? I need, I need help. Lord, one very clear lesson from this book is that when limited, ignorant, finite humans speak about you, the almighty, all-knowing, infinite God, there is great opportunity for sin and great opportunity for damage. Worst of all, worse, worse than all that, there's opportunity to make you angry, to misrepresent you. And so I pray, I beg that my words would be an accurate reflection, an accurate exposition of how you have revealed yourself to us in your word in this book. God, I need you. As I have begged you in preparation for this sermon, I ask again now, may my words be accurate, helpful, and useful. And Holy Spirit, use this sermon, and more importantly, your God-breathed words from which this sermon is derived to strengthen me and my hearers to endure the testing of our faith so that we, we might be sanctified and you glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, the book of Job, you probably know it. It's a story of a God-fearing man 
enduring suffering through in his faith in Yahweh. We are intended to consider Job and to be encouraged by his testimony, his endurance in God's purposes in his suffering so that we can endure and the suffering that God puts in our lives. So I have an outline. The point, I say, of the book, or the, the thing that we are to consider in the book of Job, is that Job endures suffering in his faith. And we're going to go chapter by chapter, four chapter chunks. The first two is chapter one and two. And we see that Job endures suffering with faith in Yahweh by responding to both blessing and calamity with godly worship. So let's jump into the text and meet this man, Job. Job 1.1. You can open your Bibles there. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. The book of Job purports at the outset to be an accurate, God-inspired book of history. It's not a fairy tale or a parable. This is a real man who existed in a real place at a real time. Occurred in the land of Uz, likely in the Middle East, and from the length of life discussed here, the locations, the people mentioned in the book, the reference to Yahweh without reference to the nation Israel, it, it's likely that Job lived in the centuries after the flood, during the time of the patriarchs, but before Moses. It might be the earliest of the Bible books written, or at least some of the earliest stories after the, one of the earliest stories after the the first chap 12 chapters of, uh, of Genesis. Job 1.1, 1, 1, we, we will continue. It says, Job, that man was blameless and upright. He was one who feared God, and he turned away from evil. And there were born to him seven sons, three daughters, and he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, very many servants. This man was the greatest of all of the people of the East. Job is introduced to us unambiguously as a blameless and upright man. And amazingly, Job was blameless and upright while also being an incredibly rich man. That pairing is rare. He was perhaps the richest of all of the people in the region, and we know from, script, from uh, experience and scripture's testimony, that uh, riches and its accompanying apparent self-sufficiency is one of Satan's most effective tools to lure our hearts away from faith in God. Job had survived that test well. Job feared God and turned away from evil. Job honored God with his wealth and Job was jealous for God's glory. And then the scene of the book changes. We, we were looking at Job, learning who he was, and then suddenly we transition to heaven. We get a glimpse there, and surprisingly, Satan is there. We don't know much about heaven and what goes on there at this point, but, but we see there is Yahweh, and the sons of God, it says, came to present themselves, verse 6, before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. And Yahweh said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered Yahweh and said, from going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down on it. And Yahweh said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions you have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all he has and he will curse you to your face. And Yahweh said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. What do we see here? Well, we see that Yahweh's assessment of Job is the same as the narrator's. Yahweh sees Job as blameless and upright. So whatever happens in this book is not punishment. We actually see that God called attention to Job. God got Satan's attention and said, look at Job. He's upright. 
He's godly. There's no one like him in all the earth. Satan didn't trick God into having Job suffer. Say, I know how I'm going to get the crown jewel in God's, of, of all of God's riches, of all God's people. God said, Satan, there he is. You want to crack at him? God set Job up. God is the one who calls attention to Job. Why, why would God do that? We aren't told. We aren't told all of God's purposes, but the narrator's point for including this is to show there's going to be a lot of confusion to come, but we need to know at the outset that beyond a shadow of, of a doubt, God was unequivocally, ultimately behind the suffering that Job was about to endure. We know something in this story that Job and his friends could not know. At least part of Job's suffering was to show Job's faith for God's glory to the watching heavenly audience. And this is how it is in all of our lives. We don't know the trillions of millions and more behind the scenes realities that God has, the purposes that he is accomplishing in what he brings into our life and all the potentialities he guards us from. We're limited in our pers perspective. We're limited in our vision. We just don't know. And even if God told us, we could not comprehend. But we must walk away from this book of Job, knowing that God reigns in the big and the small things of life for purposes that we don't know. And in this case, God was going to use Job's enduring faith to bring himself glory before the watching host of heaven as the faith that God gave Job would endure. God would also sanctify Job. And God would also use Job's life to encourage countless saints like us to remain steadfast in their faith. James 5, 11 says, as James is encouraging his readers to endure their suffering, their unjust suffering, he says, behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And know that God's purposes, even through, the, even through the bitter means of Satan's vicious attacks, God's purposes were compassionate and merciful. James goes on. Not only have you heard of the steadfastness of Job, but you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The point of the book isn't to explain all the ways or even show every way in which God's purposes were compassionate and merciful. In fact, by the end, you will see that even if God told us all of his purposes and how they were compassionate and merciful, we couldn't begin to comprehend them. But we must walk away from this book considering Job and being stirred up to emulate his endurance and faith and see God and trust that his ways, even and maybe especially when we don't understand them, are, towards his children, compassionate and merciful. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And if he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? But this does not mean that we will not suffer, and it did not mean that his precious Job that he was proud of would not suffer, but rather it means that tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, or even being slaughtered like sheep, neither angels or Satan, nor rulers, nor, power, nor powers, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. And our belief in that statement will be rattled by this book. God's sovereign goodness and power does not mean that his children will not suffer, but it does mean that no matter how purposeless how hard our suffering appears from our perspective. God is behind it with purpose, and he is not our enemy, but he is our loving God, Father, and Savior. The book of Job dives deep into the very place where the rubber meets the road of our faith. 
Who is God and is he trustworthy and good? And how does he relate to the chaos in the world, especially in our suffering? Especially in suffering that doesn't make sense and suffering that doesn't appear just or right. How we respond to the God revealed in the book of Job is a litmus test for our faith. It's amazing when you search the internet for interpretations on the book of Job. It's amazing how especially around times of flood, terrorist attacks, pandemics, earthquakes, personal illness, tragedy, you can find articles, newspaper articles, tweets, blogs, even books written about this. But apart from faith, those looking for answers in the book of Job don't find them here. They're like Job's friends who talk and talk and talk and never come up with an answer. They, they instinctively know the solution's in here. But you can't arrive at that solution apart from being humbled to a point of God-trusting faith. The book of Job's a litmus test for your faith, intended to stir it up to real faith that will be able to endure even the, the trial that you, you're pretty sure there's no way you could get through. Some argue with this book, say it's insufficient. Some dismiss the God of Job out of hand, declaring him to be capricious, unjust, irrational, power-hungry, megalomaniac, a God to be rejected, not to be embraced. Some will misrepresent the book or like Job's three friends, loquaciously pontificate about that which they don't understand and never arrive at an answer. But for those of faith, we get to the end of, book, of the book and like Job, put our hands over our mouth and worship. We learn here that Satan is real, that we know from 1 Peter 5, 8, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When God says, hey, where have you been? I've been wandering around on the earth. We know what he was up to. And as soon as God takes the shackles off Satan, the devastation that Satan brings to Job is bitterly, almost unthinkably cruel. But notice that while Satan is real, his hatred is real, and he is powerful, he is not ultimate. He can only go as far as God permits. Satan is a vicious lion that wants to destroy you but he has a leash and a muzzle. And he can only do what God permits as long as God permits it. We learn that in this book. And we know the end of the story, Revelation 20. Satan will be bound, then released, and then ultimately and finally defeated, thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where he will be tormented day and night forever. This wickedness will not go unpunished. Satan is described elsewhere as the God of this world and he hates God. But unwittingly, Satan, as he rules as God of this world, does only what God permits. And even when Satan desires to destroy the purposes of God, he is only ultimately working to accomplish them, to accomplish God's good plans. What Satan intends for evil, God doesn't just use for good. He superintends for good. We see this truth clearly at the cross where Satan was moved to kill the Son of God. And in that act of rebellion, he brought to fruition God's very gospel plan for the eternal praise of his glorious grace. John Piper writes in his excellent book, Providence, he writes, It must infuriate Satan that God's ways are so pure and brilliant that Satan not only fails to obstruct them, but unwittingly serves them. In Job's life of faith, prizing God above all of his possessions, has already brought so much glory to God. We see Satan's hatred for this man. And as soon as God takes the shackles off Satan, the suffering begins. Satan is giving permission and immediately is more cruel than you could even dream. Job didn't know the conversation that had just happened in heaven. But one day, while continuing to live in his fear of God, honoring God with his wealth, praying for his kids, 
running his businesses with integrity, enjoying the life that God had given him, worshiping God. He sees a messenger running up. The Sabaeans killed your servants. They took all your oxen and donkey. donkeys. None of them are left. And while that messenger was still speaking, another one comes. More dead servants. Your sheep are burned. While he was still speaking, another messenger. The Chaldeans attacked. Killed more servants. Took all your camels. Imagine what's going through Job's mind. In an instant, the richest man in the east found himself in poverty. What would you do? Heart racing. All those servants and animals that had defined his greatness were gone. And then Satan's savageness gets even worse. While that messenger was still speaking, you could just see it. Imagine Job's mind, what's left? Another messenger runs up and he says, out of breath, your sons and daughters. This is a real man. Could you imagine Job instinctively screaming, no, not my children, please, not my children. Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came and struck the four corners of the house and it fell. And they're all dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Not just one child, all ten. On the same day as Job lost everything. And Job arose and he tore his robe and he shaved his head and he fell on the ground. Job, and and can you imagine his poor wife, mourned. He tore his robes with tears flowing and guttural wails of agony uncontrollably coming out between the sobs at the loss of his ten children. My friends, trust in God does not mean a stoic, emotionless existence that doesn't have room for grief, but rather grief and mourning and tears are not at odds with worship. Rather, we must, as people of God, worship in our mourning, worship in our tears, worship in our suffering. And that's exactly what Job did. Read with me in awe at the amazing faith that God had given Job. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my, womb, from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. Yahweh gave and Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. Job grieved, but he didn't curse God as Satan had predicted. Rather, in his grief, he worshiped. And then in chapter 2, God set Satan up to ask for another crack at Job. Satan declares in 2.4 that Job only still holds to his integrity because he still has his health, but that certainly if his health is taken, then he'll curse God. So God permits Satan to take Job's health so long as he doesn't kill him. And Job in his misery, the once richest man of the East, now in childless poverty, is found sitting in a heap of ashes, picking at painful oozing sores, with pottery. He holds on to his faith, counseling his poor wife this time. Shall we receive good from God and not calamity? And God was glorified. Yahweh gave and Yahweh has taken away. We've received this calamity from the hand of God, Job said. But it was the Sabaeans who killed the servants and took the donkeys, right? The Chaldeans killed the servants and took the camels. Natural disasters took out the sheep and Job's 10 kids. And yet Job says, Yahweh has taken away. This calamity is from God. Job was able to rightly ascribe all of his previous wealth to God. 
said Yahweh gave. He was right when he said that. And now in his grief, he reminds himself and his wife that the same God is behind this. Yahweh has taken away. And he says it not resigned. What am I to do? But he says it with faith, with trust that leads him to worship. God's power is such that he rules over evil without being the author of it. The Sabians, the Chaldeans committed theft and murder with no thought to the glory of God. And they'll be judged for it. God had his own purposes also at work in each one of their lives. Satan was acting out of hatred towards God and Job. God will accomplish his purposes there. We know what they will be. And there was a time where Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all gathered together at Calvary Calvary, to do whatever God's hand and plan predestined to take place. Acts 4, 27 and 28. God is so powerful, like we said, that even evil serves his purposes. We know from the previous verses what Job could not know, that it was Satan at work. But Job said it was from Yahweh. Are we reading our theology into this text? Should, wouldn't it be better to say uh, God allowed it, but Satan did it? To separate God from the calamity, to get him off the hook. The inspired narrator anticipates this concern and knows that we might need interpretive help here. So he says, in all of this, immediately after each one of these statements, he said, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And again in 2.10, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. To say that God permitted Satan to cause the suffering would be right, but to say that God was the one who took away Job's health, children, and ultimately in wealth would also be right. So from the outset of this book, we know that God via Satan, is behind Job's suffering. And God obviously has purposes in it, some of which we are privy to and many we will never be provided. And Job's initial response was an amazing one. It was a right one. As he wept, he worshiped. I've been so encouraged by so many of you in this church as you face tragedy. I remember Josh Kelso's words to me on the phone. Not very many minutes after he held his son in his hand saying, blessed be the name of the Lord, I trust. God used Job to encourage his faith. To the testimony I've heard during a stillbirth, shortly after stillbirth, God knows what he's doing. I remember my own wife with tears on her trembling face as she faced the probability that our boy David would soon be dead. She declared, if God would give his son for me, I can trust him with my own. There's so many other examples from the the small things, broken down cars, lost jobs, injury, sickness, death, and more. I've seen this church repeat Job's example of worshiping God in their suffering and saying, Yahweh gave and he has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. We trust So have hope that the God who gave faith to Job and kept him from falling away is the same God who's the author of your faith. So if you look at this and say, I will never have faith like that, apart from God, you're right. The faith that Job had was faith granted by God. The faith that you have is faith given by God. If it will be sustained, it will be sustained by the same God. And I promise we won't be as slow for the rest of this. Job 3 Uh, through 31, we're going to see the next part where Job endures suffering with faith in Yahweh, but now with weary imperfection, wrestling and suffering and arguing with unhelpful friends. Having friends with us present in suffering, meeting physical needs and sympathizing with us is a sweet grace. It's a means to help us endure. We ought to look for opportunities to do that for one another. And Job 2.11 introduces us to three of these friends. Apparently there was a fourth we'll meet later. And these three friends started well, or at least they didn't start bad. Um, 
it, read with me in 2.11. Then Job's three friends heard of all this calamity that had come upon him. And so they came, each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, and they made an appointment together to come and console him and comfort him. And for a week they wept together, mourning the loss of his children. In newfound poverty, with his wife encouraging, encouraging him to curse God and die, Job sat in an ash heap, sores head to toe, his disease was brutal, worm-filled, festering wounds that robbed him of sleep, burned him with heat, and lasted for months. And finally, after a week, Job in his weariness cries out, chapter 3, Let the day perish on which I was born. In prolonged suffering, Job's words recorded here aren't quite as encouraging as his first. Job's misery builds, and his words pour out of his mouth. But he hasn't lost his faith. His words just don't quite reflect the love and trust in God as well as his first words. Why was I born? I wish I hadn't been. God, I don't get it. I feel like I can't take this anymore. In Job 6.26, Job describes these words as speech of a despairing man. He likens them to wind, something not of substance. It's here and then gone. Groanings. But in their misguided theological astuteness and feeling the need to defend God, Job's friends take these words as requiring rebuke. We have to know when to help. We have to know when to encourage and know when to admonish. This is not a time to admonish. They would have done better to stay quiet, to pray for Job, to continue to weep with Job, or perhaps pray with him for prayer, strength, endurance. Instead, they speak. And much of what they say, when read alone, sounds theologically sound, very similar to the Proverbs or Psalms or other parts of Scripture, but they demonstrate the accuracy of Proverbs 26.8. It says, Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. First, Eliphaz rebukes Job for being impatient. He says, your words used to help others while they suffered, and now, now you're suffering and you can't be patient? It touches you and you're dismayed? That's four, four, and five. How unloving, unhelpful, and inaccurate an assessment of the totality of Job's response in this trial. And then to make things worse, Eliphaz goes on to declare that since sovereign God is a righteous judge and Job is suffering, obviously from God, they never doubt that God is here. But they come to the conclusion that it must be evidence that Job has committed great sin that he needs to repent from. And Eliphaz used some accurate theological truths to get there, but he combined them with his ignorance, mixed in a little bit of impatience and lovelessness, and he heaped more suffering upon his already despairing friend. This is the definition of adding insult to injury. It's a great privilege and responsibility to be at the bedside or the ash heap side of a friend who's despairing. Choose your words wisely. Just as we look to this book to see Job as, a, as an example of perseverance, we see, we see some good, bad examples here not to emulate. And at the end of the book, God judges these friends. He declares that their words weren't just ignorant and wrong, but he says that their anger burns against them because they did not speak rightly of God. They misrepresented God. But Job responds then by defending himself, protesting his innocence. According to the theological paradigm that Eliphaz and his friends have set forth, this suffering makes no sense. Job can't identify a cause and effect. I didn't do anything to deserve this. Job knows he's not sinless, but he was more righteous than those around him who weren't suffering. This cause and effect paradigm just didn't make sense. It, we know that the opposite was at work, that God was actually granting Satan permission to do this because Job was 
upright. That because Job turned from evil, not committing it, but Job's friends didn't know that. And the very nature of their unhelpful admonitions leads Job now to a position of protesting and defending himself. He complains against his friends. He, he says, I have not denied the words of the Holy One, like you're saying I did. And he, and he admonishes his friends for their poor comfort. Miserable comforters are you all. He even says, he who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. The friends should have heard that and been cut to the quick and been, you're right, you need help. But sadly, this pattern continues for three cycles. This is a pattern of chapters 3 through 31. Basically, it's three cycles where Job speaks, Eliphaz speaks. Job speaks, Bildad speaks. Zo Job speaks, Zophar speaks. And then the cycle repeats twice more. But the third time, uh, Zophar doesn't finish. As we look at those examples, the, the friend's speech get more and more and more harsh as time goes on. And their words become shorter, or their, their dialogues become shorter and shorter. Job, on the other hand, becomes more and more adamant, longer and longer and longer. And by the end, Zophar has nothing to say. He hasn't been helpful, but, but there's nothing else he can say. Job has argued successfully that they're wrong. But in doing so, Job's come to a position of justifying himself at the expense of God. This paradigm of right and wrong has set Job up to view God as his antagonist, as his enemy. And by, in chapter 23, turn there. This is where Job most clearly goes wrong. Job says a lot of good things. Job expresses confidence that God will vindicate him, even if it's not until after death. He between valleys of weary despair and peaks of faith and weak resignation and confidence in God. Job just wavers. He's, he's not in a solid spot. It's understandable. But Job gets to a point where he says some, some things that now need rebuke. But his friends are in no position to hear it, no position to rebuke him. Chapter 23, Job says, Oh, that I knew where I might find Yahweh. He's pretty sure that God, God needs to see things right. Job knows that he hasn't sinned. He goes, that I might even come to his seat, to God's seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know that he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. Job began thinking of God as his enemy or maybe a too powerful but not right judge. How can, I, how can I argue with God? He's clearly more powerful than me. But he was putting God in the wrong. And Job wanted an audience with God, confident that if he could only argue his case, he was certain that he himself, Job, not God, would be in the right on this one. Job didn't even stop to consider maybe this wasn't cause and effect. Maybe this wasn't judgment. He didn't consider how could God's purposes be good and compassionate here. He had moved a long way from where he started. A humble, trusting faith that, that moved to worship. And soon God would actually give Job that face-to-face -face meeting. But it won't go the way Job thinks it will. Guys, it's really possible. We like to talk theology here, and that's a good thing. But it's really possible that while we're doing theology and discussing things of God, we can forget the majestic transcendence of the God of whom we speak and start to think of him like he's one of us. Have you ever thought about something? Here's the things I have to confess I've thought of. Mosquitoes, anterior cruciate ligaments, and fainting goats. And I've wondered, why did you do it that way? That's, there's better ways to do that, God. Or, or maybe you said, why did you let sin into this world? Wouldn't it have been better to just never have planted a tree in the middle of the garden? Be careful when your mind starts going here. Don't forget who you are talking about when you think you might know better than God. Don't forget who you are. 
But anyway, so after three rounds of this back and forth, a young man, Elihu, who's been waiting patiently, silently, listening, speaks up. And now we're at 32 through 37, where Job still endures suffering with faith in Yahweh, but now he is listening quietly to a more helpful friend. Some say that Elihu is just as wrong as his friends. I, I disagree. Elihu's message is different than Job's other friends. He brings necessary correction to both. And it's important to note that whereas God rebuked Job's three friends, no correction comes to Elihu in the book. Job had a lot to argue with with the three friends' statements. He has nothing to say in response to Elihu. He even ends up following his advice. But only after God comes on the scene. So what does Elihu... Oh, I... Yeah, what does Elihu have to say? How, how does he serve the role in this book of a helpful counselor? It does seem unfair at points. I'm not saying that every single thing that Elihu says is perfect, but, but Elihu's role is one as a better counselor than the other friends. And he succeeds. So what does he say? Well, he summarizes it, thankfully, in 32, 1 through 3. This will help me get through this section faster because I know I'm slow. Elihu summarizes what he's going to say for us. He says, it says, these three men, in 32, 1 through 3, these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. And then Elihu, the son of Barachel the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned with anger. He burned with anger at Job, because he justified himself instead of God. And he burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they declared to, that Job would, or declared Job to be in the wrong. And then chapters 32 through 37, um, Elihu brings that admonition first against Job's friends and then against Job. The anger that led him to speak he puts it into words, and he puts forth a much more nuanced and accurate theology that allowed for suffering that might accomplish God, God's good and wise purposes beyond maybe just a simple karmic, retributive, cause and effect thinking that Job's, Job's friends had fallen into. All the while, he declared the transcendent majesty of God that should have guarded them from errors and kept Job in the place of wor worshipful trust where he began. And this perspective is right and true. God does use suffering to accomplish good things for us that couldn't possibly come in prosperity. God has good purposes in all that he does. And these purposes, just like God, are above us, too great for us to comprehend. Elihu has room in his theology for suffering, or suffering for the wicked. I'm sorry, God has, Elihu has room in his theology where the wicked who should suffer prosper, at least to our eyes, and where the faithful suffer. And God is still operating from a righteous perspective with wisdom and power that we can't understand. And he still says that it will tend to be that righteous God who judges will make the wicked to suffer in the end. And the righteous will tend to prosper. But it's not always that way, at least not in our time frame, not from our perspective. God will not do wickedly, Elihu says, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. For some, God does bring suffering as just retribution. And for others, he brings suffering as an expression of kindness, like a teacher, a father. And in chapter 37, even while Elihu is declaring God's majestic power seen in creation, namely in the thunder and the wind, it seems like a thunderstorm rolls in. And God speaks for himself. And now we get to the climax of the book, 38 through 42. Job endures suffering with faith in Yahweh now with humble belief, confession, and worship before Almighty God. But first, he gets that meeting he asked for. Chapter 38. Then Yahweh answers Job out of the whirlwind. 
And immediately Job's confidence of chapter 23, that once he got a face-to-face meeting with God, God would be forced to pay, pay attention to Job to acquit him. Things don't. I, I guess Job gets his, uh, his perspective recalibrated. Job had declared that if he got a face-to-face meeting with God, God would answer Job. And now, Job, now God himself demands that Job answers him. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Were you there when I made it? I was. I did it. I did it by my wisdom and might. So dress for action like a man. I'm going to question you and you answer me. See who pays attention to who, God says. Job needs his perspective of God, his perception of God and his relation to him adjusted. He needs to remember, maybe learn for the first time and in a way that he could only learn through suffering with a face-to-face meeting who God is. It's amazing. We learn more in suffering than we ever do. I, I personally have than I do when I'm studying God's word at the quiet calmness of my, of my desk in my office. And Job, in his ash heap, face to face with the whirlwind, is about to learn who God really is and who he is. God now brings up day two and three of creation when he separated the water and caused dry land to appear. Did I do that right, he asks? 38, 8 through 11. Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb, when I made clouds its garment, thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it and set bars on the doors and said, thus far you shall come and no farther. Here your proud waves be stayed. Job, do you cause the sun to rise each day? Is it by your power that the earth rotates on its axis? 38, 12. Or what about light, Job? Did you make that? Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Where is the place to darkness? And our 21st century brains might cause us to raise our hands in pride, saying, yeah, I know, I know something about light that Job didn't know. Light's like an electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths that can be detected by the human eye. It can be described as strings of photons, particles traveling through space with wave-like properties. A photon, it's the smallest, it's the quantum of energy that can be transported. It's, it's quantum theory. We know all about that. We're all smart now. And God laughs. He, yeah, pretty complicated, right? I, I did that on day one with a word. And it exists and is sustained by my power. And the sum of the genius of all of your quantum physicists put together are like pitting the knowledge of a toddler against the Library of Congress and then some. What about the weather, Job? The snow, the hail. Do you know how I do that? When it floods, who determines the path the water's going to take? Do you want to lecture me on that too? Did you know that when, I, when it rains, I bring rain on fields that no man will see, causing flowers to bloom for nobody to enjoy but myself? You can do one thing at once, Job. I do millions of trillions and every single one in perfect control, accomplishing my perfect will. What about the stars and constellations from the night sky, Job? 38, 31. Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the chains of Orion? And those are just the stars in our little galaxy. Galaxy. Little did Job know that the little fuzzy area that he saw in the sky was the Andromeda galaxy that contained more than a trillion stars in itself. And there were 200 billion other galaxies at least just like them. We don't know. We can't see them all. There's blind spots. God made them, rules them, with the same perfect control that he has when the rain falls on the field that nobody will see but himself, on some planet, on some far-off star, in some galaxy that we don't even know exists. 
that God rules with the same precision. All while he's listening to our prayers and getting us safely from here home and knows whether a sparrow falls to the ground and knows the numbers of hairs on your head and cares for you and provides everything you need loves you like a father all while he rules the world and the universe and beyond and God moves closer to home animals can you provide food for the lion and raven 38 39 through 41 think of what this entails Provision for the entire food chain. Sovereignty working within natural means to have some lions eat well and others go hungry, all according to his purposes. Like I said, not a sparrow falls to the ground without God and not a lion or raven eat apart from his provision. Think about what that means. We say these things, mind blown. For God to do all of that perfectly without distraction for his purposes. Job, you don't even know where the mountain goats breed. I see every one. The wild donkey who humans can't tame, I made him that way. The wild ox who's willing to work for you, I did that as a gift for mankind. The stupid ostrich who's so pretty and yet so dumb that he leaves its eggs out in the open and then steps on it and kills his own young. I made stupid things for my purpose, God declares. Want to know why I did that? I'm not telling you. And the war horse and the hawk and on and on. Job, where are you in all of this? 40 verse 1, shall a fault finder contend with God? He who argues with God, let him answer. I'm sure Job just wants to be done. He says, I'm of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. But God didn't take Job through all this suffering for nothing. He wants to drive the point home to bring Job and us out of the confused muddle of our ignorant theological prognostications and set our eyes on God's glory and power. So he goes on. He says, dress for action like a man. I'm going to question you. You make it known to me. Will you put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you might be in the right? And you get a sense of what it will be to stand before the judge who knows everything. But if you stand before this God who knows everything you have done and judges rightly with this kind of power and you're not clothed with Jesus, if you're not his son, oh my goodness, fear. But God is not lecturing Job here out of anger, out of punishment. Maybe there's some anger there, righteous anger, but it's certainly not vindictive. It's not punishment. It is compassionate and merciful. He wants to bring Job back to a position where he would worship God. Back, he's sustaining Job's faith in ours as well. But Job's position back in chapter 23 and what Elihu rebuked him for, that all seems so foolish now in the face of the whirlwind. God describes this creature, behemoth, the creature that makes man know his smallness. God made him. And the untamable, unstoppable Leviathan made him too. He does what I want. Chapter 42. Job answered Yahweh and said, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked me, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? That was me. I uttered what I didn't understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. Hear, and I I will speak. I will hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. You said, "I've heard, and by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I despise myself. I know who I am in comparison to you, and I repent in dust and ashes." God showed Job that he is powerful and God showed Job that he is not random or arbitrary or capricious in the expression of that power, but rather he is wise. 
and he operates from a perspective and a scope that we can't even fathom. God never told Job why he was suffering, and Job didn't ask. Not anymore. Job could worship God again and endure confidently that the one running the universe was big and strong and also wise and good. And God rebukes Job's friends, and gives, but he gives them an opportunity for forgiveness. He declares, you have not spoken to those three. He says, you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. And he gave them an opportunity for forgiveness, saying, Job, they should bring sacrifices and have Job offer them on his, their behalf, and God would forgive. We're starting to see some of God's compassionate and merciful purposes. Job's friends probably never would have seen their arrogance without their friends suffering. Job wouldn't have seen God face to face apart from suffering. And maybe we wouldn't have been able to be sustained through our trials the same way without Job suffering and how many other purposes that we couldn't even fathom. We see that Job's faith endured, not with a stable, sinful, or sinless perfection. But here and finally, we see a kind of faith that we can emulate. One that is demonstrated through confession and repentance when you see sin. Right? When you see Job, you see a man with an amazing faith at the beginning. One that I want to emulate in the next trial. But also a man that sinned. But a man whose faith, who endured. And he, his endurance was accomplished because he didn't hold on to his sin. He confessed. He repented and he turned. God is powerful. What is right is defined by God. What God does is right, but not merely because God says it is. Right? God, God could be like a tyrant, just says, yep, I'm God. What I do, that defines right. But no, God actually has a, a pers perspective and a wisdom to know what is right, to know what is best. And he does that too. What is right and best isn't a standard outside of God that we can measure him by, that he has to live up to, that we can apply to him to check how he is doing. No, what is best and right is what God does. And what he does is best and right. And as people of faith, we should want it no other way. And we can trust that that is true, even when we don't understand, even when we can't see how it possibly could be, especially in the midst of our suffering. So Christian, no matter what we face in this life, when we consider Job and the God of Job that this book reveals. If you have faith in Jesus, if this big, scary, powerful God is your father, you can look to Jesus in whatever trial you face and trust that your heavenly father is in control and you can endure with faith. God, thank you for this book. Thank you for the messages that we covered, for what I was able to talk about this morning, or this evening. And I pray that it would sustain us. And I also just pray that this overview, the giving the context of the message of the book would give us a chance to dive deeper into its chapters, to wrestle with what it and who it declares you to be, to be encouraged more by Job's faith, by his endurance, that you would use this book and all of your word to sustain us in this race of faith that you've set before us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.